these cells drive multiple degenerative path pathologies. Dr. Wiley discovered a distinct form of senescence driven by mitochondrial dysfunction, known as mitochondrial dysfunction-associated senescence, or MIDAS. He also discovered that senescent cells promote clotting and coagulation and identified altered lip lipid metabolism as a major property of senescent cells. Dr. Wiley is an outstanding speaker, and it's really my privilege to introduce you all to him today. So without further ado, Dr. Chris Wiley, we're really looking forward to your seminar, and we will have plenty of time at the end for questions and answers. And I would just remind everybody to use the question and answer function in the, the Zoom chat the, uh, so that we can uh, read the questions and have Dr. Wiley uh, respond to them. So please take it away, Dr. Wiley. Thank you so much, Roger. I, I just want to confirm, uh, Roger, can everyone see this okay? Perfect, wonderful. Thank you so much, Roger, despite all the technical difficulties. And thank you to everyone today who's taking time out of their lunch to listen to me tell you a little something about how I approach and target aging using this process that Roger did a great job describing in the form of cellular senescence. So it probably doesn't come as a surprise to most of you that aging is the number one risk, oh, excuse me, <laughs> number one risk factor for developing a host of degenerative conditions. Whether we're talking about Alzheimer's and Parkinson's in our brains, macular degeneration in the eye, osteoporosis, arthritis, diabetes, all of these conditions and many, many more become much, much more prevalent as we get older. And because of that, it's really important to consider age as a risk factor for so many different conditions. And an example of this is cancer. So we know that there are many risk factors that you've heard about probably at length, such as smoking and obesity and alcoholism that are known to drive cancer. And it's, these are very important factors. I don't want to get you, don't, I don't want you to take away from this that they're not. For example, smoking is the number one thing you can do right now to keep yourself from getting cancer or stopping smoking, I should say. Uh, but just being over the age of 55 increases your risks more than all these factors together. And the reason we don't typically talk about that is that the perception was there's really nothing you can do about getting older. And I think that that perception is now changing. And I'll tell you a little something about why we think that is today. So we know that degenerative diseases rise exponentially with age. And it's not just one disease, it's a lot of diseases all at once for most people. And we don't think this is a coincidence. There have to be one or more basic processes that drive aging and most or all of these age-related diseases. And so you can imagine that if you can target those basic aging processes, you can prevent multiple diseases as we get older. And our goal here is to change that incidence so that we can pr live healthier lives as we get older. So we've identified a few of these processes and the one that I study is here, it's called cellular senescence. But I don't want you to think that these processes are all acting independently of each other. For example, all these processes, whether we're talking about genomic instability, telomere attrition, or mitochondrial dysfunction, all of them can drive cellular senescence. Cellular senescence, in turn, can drive stem cell exhaustion and altered intracellular communication. So I like to think of senescence as this nexus for a lot of different aging pathways that we can target to improve uh, outcomes for people who are aging. So what is cellular senescence? Well, the key feature of it is, is that it's a stress response. Cells that are dividing stop dividing when they undergo certain forms of stress, and then they become senescent cells. These stresses include genomic and epigenomic damage. In other words, things that tell, that break our DNA and cause damage to our DNA. Mutations that activate oncogenes, in other words, things that drive cancer. Metabolic imbalances, such as diabetes, um, and then organelle stressors, such as problems with our mitochondria. All of these can drive cellular senescence. And the key features of cellular senescence include a inverse, irreversible growth arrest. So once a cell senesces, it no longer will ever divide again. It is in a permanent lockdown. Um, so that cell is just gonna do that for the rest of its life. Uh, furthermore, senescent cells aren't just gonna sit there. They're going to secrete a bunch of factors, which we call this multifaceted secretory phenotype or senescence-associated secretory phenotype, or SASP. 
which is a combination of chemokines, growth factors, proteases, and other molecules that can cause disease. Finally, I just want to point out that we can identify senescent cells uh, by staining them for an enzyme called senescence-associated beta-galactosidase, and that's just going to give them a blue color. So if I show you blue throughout the rest of my talk, I'm showing you increased senescent cells. So how do we think that senescent cells might drive aging? Well, there's the growth arrest, which is cell autonomous. That just means it only affects that cell. And if that cell happens to be a stem cell or other form of progenitor cell, that cell is not gonna contribute in a meaningful way to that tissue ever again. And that if you have too many of those, you could imagine a situation in which your, cell, your body is unable to regenerate after injury. Now, we think that the SASP, uh, which is cell non-autonomous, meaning it influences the cells around it, is a much more problematic part of senescence because it, those secreted factors can do things like drive sterile inflammation, disrupt the environment around the cell, and lead to other perturbed signaling events that together can cause disease. So we know that senescent cells show up in virtually every vertebrate, meaning fish get senescent cells with age, frogs get senescent cells with age, mice, monkeys, and humans all get senescent cells as we age. And in if you get old enough, they appear in virtually every tissue we've looked at. So they're really a nice potential in, uh, driver of aging because they show up everywhere. And you can see them here, for example, these blue cells that I was telling you about in the skin of uh, an older individual. So if senescent cells are showing up at the right time and at the right place to drive aging and these age-related diseases, that makes them a pretty good suspect for driving a good part of aging. But the question has always been, do they actually drive aging? And I think we know at least part of the answer to this now. Uh, so this is work that was done at the Mayo Clinic in which they made a mouse where they could eliminate a set of senescent cells by giving a drug to them, abbreviated here as AP. So they're killing some senescent cells here. And what they did is they gave it to these mice and, and continually eliminated senescent cells as they got older. Um, so they started at middle age and then they went older. So if you look at survival as a percentage here, uh, as, you, as you know, as we get older, fewer and fewer of us survive. Same thing with mice. So this is a normal mouse lifespan with all of its senescent cells. This is the lifespan of, a mouse, of mice that have had their senescent cells removed. You can see that they live substantially longer, about 27% longer, which is, you know, pretty considerable, but it's not that they just lived longer. Uh, if they live just lived longer, but they were sick and unhealthy, that wouldn't be good. They actually looked healthier. So these are two age-matched mice. They're in fact siblings. This one has all of its senescent cells. This one does not. And you can see that this looks like a happy, healthy, normal mouse. This mouse has lost its, some of its hair. It's hunched over. It's not healthy. It's what you would expect an old mouse to be. Um, but we also know that many diseases of aging are likely to be caused by senescent cells. And we know that interventions that cause senescent cells to occur in our bodies can drive premature aging. And you probably have had some experience with this without knowing it. Uh, if you've ever known anyone that has had cancer and has had to go through chemotherapy or radiation therapy, I've had three members who have had, uh, who've had cancer, including one that I lost to the disease. Um, and it's very obvious when they're going through those therapies that they are showing signs of premature aging. Uh, and if you haven't, if you're lucky en enough to not have seen this, uh, you, you can still um, get an idea of this if you watch the NFL draft tonight because uh, reporter Chris Mortensen, who works for ESPN, was diagnosed with cancer in 2016. And so you can see the before and after of Chris, before and after he um, received uh, chemotherapy and cancer therapies. And we know that most cancer therapies drive senescence. So you can really see that difference there and that premature aging that senescence can cause. Um, it's still better than dying of cancer, but it, it still can have, effect. you can see that senescence cells have effects. Uh, an idea that I found that is a very similar concept came from people who are infected with HIV. So as you probably know, HIV is the virus that causes AIDS. So if this is the general lifespan of people who are not infected with HIV, 
And this is the lifespan of people who are infected with HIV who do not receive treatment. You can see, generally speaking, at some point they develop AIDS and they will die and their lifespan is severely decreased. But that's not what happens with most people once they're um, diagnosed with HIV. Now, when you're diagnosed with HIV, you go on antiviral drugs and those antiviral drugs keep you from getting AIDS. But you'll notice that even though they're not getting AIDS and they're not dying of AIDS anymore, they're still not living as long as uninfected people. They're living, you know, like a decade less. And when they show up in the clinic, they show up with features that collectively resemble aging. And so I wanted to develop this uh, as a potential model for aging in mice. So I uh, treated mice with a combination of HIV drugs known as tenofovir and emtricitabine or TDF and FTC. Uh, we, this is sold to people under the brand name Truvada and it's used for free exposure prophylaxis, which is to say that people who are not infected with HIV but may become infected, say if you're the spouse of someone who's infected with HIV, you would take uh, PrEP um, and you would then be resistant or would not uh, acquire HIV. And this is, uh, if you can probably see commercials for this. If you've ever seen a man get up and say, I'm on the pill in a drug commercial, that's Truvada that they, they were marketing there. And you can see that after a, a about eight weeks, which is actually years in mouse time um, compared to humans, they actually uh, age prematurely. So these are age matched mice, but one of them was, treat, was being treated with an HIV suppressive therapy. And you can see also that human cells treated with this therapy also become senescent. Again, that blue in color indicating senescence. So the bad news is senescent cells cause or contribute to a large number of age-related conditions, including Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease in our brains, atherosclerosis and cardiovascular dysfunction in the heart and surrounding systems, uh, cancer metastasis and reoccurrence, chemotherapy side effects, as well as HIV therapy, including things like blood clots uh, and fatigue. Uh, by the way, anything in red here is something I've actually personally worked on. Uh, in our eyes, senescent cells drive cataracts and retinopathy. They are also responsible for both driving diabetes, but also diabetes complications. Uh, they drive pulmonary fibrosis and osteoarthritis and osteoporosis. So a large number of different age-related disorders. And by the way, this list is no longer up to date. We just can't keep up with the number of diseases that seem to be driven by senescent cells. It seems like every other month there's a new one that's discovered. Uh, but senescent cells aren't all bad. I don't want you to think that they're just a bad thing uh, because in context, they show up at the sites of wounds and they help us heal our wounds. They also are required for uh, normal embryonic development and they send the signal that initiates live birth or uh, causes women to call, go into labor. So you wouldn't want to use a senescence targeted therapy if you were recovering from surgery or if you were pregnant um, for relatively obvious reasons. But the good news is we can actually intervene in senescence driven pathology. Uh, most of this work is done in mice, but we're starting to uh, work in people as well. So there are a form of, of compound called senolytics. These are compounds that kill senescent cells. And one of the first ones that was discovered is called fisetin. It is a flavonoid and it's found in strawberries. Uh, this is not something where you could take a couple strawberries every day and get a dose that would kill your senescent cells. This is something where you'd have to eat a ridiculous number of strawberries to do this, uh, so don't try it. <laughs> uh, but you can see that mice that are given fisetin, these are prematurely aged mice, have less blue staining, again, blue in this case indicating senescence, um, than mice that are given a control diet. On top of that, if they give mice fisetin at middle age and ask how long they live, they fisetin fed mice live longer than control mice. So this is kind of not just fisetin, but the entire senolytic idea has really resulted in the development of a billion dollar industry now. There are many, many, many companies. I think somebody tried to tell me over a hundred companies in the analytics space now. Um, this is a major focus uh, and this is kind of the next revolution in drug discovery right now. Uh, so it probably doesn't come as a surprise that I'm working on this as well. Uh, so what I discovered was that there is a specific fatty acid that is made in small amounts in our body. It's called dihelmogammalinolenic acid or DGLA. 
um, but you can only get in small amounts in the diet. But if I increase those amounts by giving mice, aged mice uh, large amounts of DGLA, you can see that they go from having quite a few senescent cells, again, that blue there indicating senescence, to fewer senescent cells. And then if I compare aged mice that have had DGLA with mice that have not, and we look for senescence, again, blue uh, in that fat, you can see that they have almost no senescent cells relative to the fat of age matched mice that have not had DGLA. And the same thing happens in the liver as well. So this kind of presents a new target for drug discovery. And yes, uh, I am in the process of developing drugs for this, but it's also an opportunity for nutrition and agriculture. And it's a, really been a fun adventure for me to join the HNRCA and to be exposed to the USDA and to nutritionists and to see the way they think and kind of challenge myself to think like them. Uh, and in the process of doing this, I discovered that people were developing DGLA enriched soybeans. And so, DG, so soybeans make a large amount, uh, over 50% of their oil is linoleic acid, which is a precursor of DGLA, but plants can't really convert it all the way into DGLA. So a researcher, Xiao Benzong at uh, North Dakota State University uh, added a couple of enzymes to these plants to Make it, make it so that they make DGLA enriched oils. Um, so I'd invite you to think of a future where you go out for sushi and you get that little bowl of edamame as, a, as an aside there. And by the time you're done eating that edamame, you've t eaten enough uh, DGLA that you've, you've uh, prevented yourself from getting some age-related pathology. I, I don't know if it'll work that way, but it's an idea we're working towards. So there is a problem with senolytics, which is we don't really know that they're working very, it's, or it's very difficult to know that they're working. And for the reason, one of the reasons for this is like most of aging, it takes months to years to know if you're having an effect on something like that. And senescent cells are no exception to this. So if you want to know that your senolytics are working, uh, there's only one way to do it right now. Uh, and that's what they're doing at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, which is that they will give, they will take a biopsy, so a carve a piece of your skin, <laughs> that sounds more brutal than it is, it's a surgical procedure. They'll remove a piece of your skin or your fat before you get a senolytic, oops, excuse me, or after you get a senolytic, and then they just test for markers of senescence there. Now, as you can imagine, this is time consuming, it's painful, and it's invasive. This is not something that we would want to do for people across the world. So we had this question that what if there was a simple test we could use to demonstrate that a senolytic is working? Uh, and we just published this. So there is a lipid, dihomo gamma or dihomo 15 dpgj 2 um, So it's different than dihomo gamma linoleic acid, so it's, but, it's, uh, but it's unique to senescent cells. And it accumulates in very large amounts inside of senescent cells. And when we give a senolytic therapy that kills senescent cells, it becomes released and then we can detect it in biological fluids. So what we're working on right now is we're trying to get this up and running at the HNRC so that we can test uh, biological samples like your urine, have you pee in a cup or uh, your, test your blood and know whether or not the senolytic therapy you're being treated with is actually working. And that's something we're hoping to have up and running um, at the, by the end of the summer so we can start hopefully testing um, people that are getting treated with these, um, these compounds. So to summarize what I've told you today, senescent cells drive aging and age-related disease. Um, we can also use senolytics to lower the burden of senescent cells and in so doing prevent a lot of these diseases we associate with age. Um, and now for the first time, we're able to start detecting senolysis in bodily fluids. Um, this is a very rosy picture I painted for you. Um, there are some caveats to this and I think it's important to always acknowledge these. The first one is of course that senescent cells are sometimes good. I told, talked about senescent cells being important for wound healing. So you could imagine a situation where you wouldn't want to ha have senolytics used. Uh, also, almost all of these disorders were detected or were characterized in mice. We know that senescent cells promote a lot of diseases in mice, but it's not clear that they'll all work in people. Probably some of them won't, but almost certainly at this point when you've got 30 or more diseases, some will. 
Um, finally, we don't, or second to finally, we really don't know anything about DGLA in the diet because it's not something we find in large amounts in the diet. So we don't know how that's going to work in people yet. So we have to, we have to address safety there. Um, and we also have to show that our test for synolysis actually works in human patients. Everything we've done so far is in human cells and in mice. So we, that's our next step there that we're working towards. Uh, with that, I'd like to acknowledge the various people that made this possible. Uh, the Buck, at the Buck Institute, Judy Campisi was my former advisor, and I initiated the um, biomarker project in her lab, uh, teaming with Arvind Ramanathan. Uh, now we're moving this project here to Tufts, and uh, Sarah Booth has been a big guidance in getting this going. And Greg Tolnikowski in our mass spectrometry core is the one who's helping me develop the test here at Tufts. Uh, with the soybean project, uh, Mike Grusak at the USDA Airs in Fargo was the one that introduced me to Xiaobin Zong so we could start this, that part of the project. And finally, my funding right now through the USDA and also through the Tufts Healthy Aging Initiative. I'd like to, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Well, thank you very much, Chris, for a really stimulating presentation about your work in senescence and, and aging. Um, so if folks have questions, uh, please submit them through the Q&A and we can, we can answer them. Um, maybe, maybe one thing, I guess I would just sort of ask, oh, here we go. Um, uh, Larissa Mazepina asked, what is the contribution of, of glycation reactions to aging? Oh, that's a really complicated question. So uh, I think Alan Taylor at the HNRC is actually a better expert in that than me. Uh, having said that, I actually have done a little tiny bit of work in glycation and senescence, and we do know that uh, ages do seem to be associated with senescence. The relationship is barely explored. Um, I've done the work mostly with Pankaj Kapahi at the Buck Institute, and he would be a better person to talk to than me. Another question coming in. Uh, what criteria do you have for choosing patients for application of your work. So, so who are we, I guess the question is probably related to the senolytic therapies, who, who, who are getting these treatments? So, so first of all, we aren't doing any of the clinical trials. We're not initiating them here right now. Uh, th those are all being done around the world. Um, a large number of them are being done by companies, but Mayo Clinic is doing a lot of them. So they're typically looking for diseases that are associated with aging that might be driven with senescence. So uh, examples would be uh, diabetic kidney disease. There's a, a clinical trial for senolytics with diabetic kidney disease. They're looking at frailty. Um, so looking for, and uh, also since idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is a disease that will kill people, it's been fast tracked for, for senolytic studies as well. So those are three I know of off the top of my head. I, I'll, I'll jump in until we, oh, here we go. There's another one. Can you discuss the relationship between senescence and diet, e.g. perhaps like anti-inflammatory diets? And, and also, I guess my favorite topic, regular exercise, someone asked about too. So, <laughs> yeah. but. Yeah, so, so exercise actually is a good way of fighting off uh, senescence. Uh, so that's, that's absolutely uh, known at this point. It's not super great. It, it works. It works in small, mild amounts and it seems to mostly, um, it seems to be good for the health part of senescence, but doesn't seem to be as good for the lifespan part. So, so, so exercise is a little weird in that it, you see more lowering of senescence associated secretory phenotype markers, but not so much a lowering of the number of senescent cells, if that makes sense. So there are probably other parts of senescence that, that can cause problems still. But I, you know, the number one thing you can do right now to live longer is to exercise. So it, it's certainly something I would, it's the one thing I'll advocate right now without any question. Yeah, and we get a follow-up question from Ken Tatum, but what implications does all this work have for, you know, changes in behavior that people can do now? And I guess your answer is in part that, you know, there is some link with physical activity and exercise yep. and, and maybe other behaviors that, you know, right. And, and quitting think, smoking, but, but, but I, th I think in the next, yeah, quitting smoking is an obvious one, right? Um, the big things right now are, you know, 
don't contract HIV, don't get cancer. Um, it, it sounds bad, but it, those are really things you can do to kind of prevent the premature aspects of aging through early accumulation of senescent cells. We're still in early days here. Um, dietary um, intervention is still really in the beginning. And I'm actually really excited to be here at Tufts because I actually can do that kind of work here. Um, so hopefully we'll be uh, giving you some information on that in the next five to 10 years. So Bing Wang asks, anti-aging has been studied by many institutions around the world for decades. Do you expect any FDA approved therapies to become available in the near future? So the, it's a tricky business actually studying aging and doing therapies for aging. It's a lot easier to come up with a therapy for an age related disease because this is kind of the way our medical establishment exists, right? It's kind of one disease, one treatment. Um, so most of the interventions that um, the, the, the kind of the process for age FDA um, deregulation for these things is for diseases. So what people are doing with senolytics is they're testing them for individual diseases, even if they might have broader implications for aging. Uh, it's the same thing with metformin, right? We think that metformin is very likely to be able to do to uh, extend people's lifespan, but we're really, all of our data comes from diabetics because you know, the only people that are going to get metformin are going to be diabetics. So it's, it's still, we don't have a structure right now for testing aging. And they're, they are um, developing this. The targeting aging with metformin trial or TAME trial is the first example of this. I invite people to, uh, to look that up. It's T-A-M-E um, and just T-A-M-E and metformin. And that is the kind of, that's gonna be the first step towards figuring out how we're going to, to, to create a world where we can use aging as an outcome for medicine. Great. Uh, our friend Johanna Dwyer asks, Tufts has a vet school. Is anyone doing work on senolytics uh, at the vet school or in pets or animals? Uh, yeah. Maybe I can get them to. I, it's a great idea. Uh, not that I'm aware of. Um, I would be very excited for this. Um, I, I'm literally a, a few days away from uh, having lost my own cat to cancer. Um, so I would absolutely love to be able to uh to you know help people's pets and i think that would be a great way of going with things um yeah i'd love to be able to talk to them about that um the pandemic makes everything a little bit trickier but uh down the line i would absolutely love to do that great larissa mazapina asks what is your opinion of using nad metabolites for slowing aging so um i've actually done some work with uh, nad metabolites uh for my for my own um, research. And actually we do have some relationships between them and um, senescence. They're probably fine. <laughs> um, the results so far in mice are pretty good. Um, and there's no reason to think that, that they're gonna be worse. There's one paper that studies it in senescence that shows that NAD, uh, nicotinamide mononucleotide, uh, which makes NAD um, is actually increases the SASP in senescent cells. Um, but we, I also just published a paper with uh, Anthony Covarrubias, who is a new faculty at um, UCLA, where we showed that senescent cells actually make factors that cause macrophages to destroy, to destroy NAD. So there are other ways of intervening without just direct supplementation as well that we might be able to use by, by targeting senescent cells to just maintain NAD levels. Uh, in our body without actually supplementing. So I, their, prob their safety's so far been pretty good, but I think um, I like, I, obviously I'm a little biased, but I like my approach a little bit better. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, Kayla Butera asks, when the mice in your experiments were treated with DGLA, were the lowered levels of senescent cells maintained? Or do they have to get repeated dosing of DGLA? That's a good question. I think it's an issue with a lot of these treatments. Yep. But. So, so the good news with, with senolytics is you can take a little bit of a hit and run approach, meaning you can give the senolytic and even if it has side effects, it's not, if those side effects are chronic side effects as opposed to, to acute, 
it's very it's very easy because you can give a senolytic for a couple of days, clear the senescent cells, and then wait for them to build up again. But the reality is that the those other processes that I showed that were upstream of senescent cells are constantly going in our bodies as well, and those can create new senescent cells. So you're you're going to want any senolytic therapy is going to want to consistently come back and clear them out. And, you know, you can imagine that being once a month or once a year or whatever the, uh, the ideal dose is, right? We don't know that quite yet because we're still in the early days. Okay, uh, we just got another um, question in that said, Tufts has always been in the forefront with food and diet. Will those parts of the university take a role in research on the diet relationship? I think you sort of answered that already, but maybe you want, might want I to stay I would absolutely love bit. for us to be able to do that. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the dream, right? Yeah, that's what we want to do here. So I'm hoping to build towards that. Great, great. And Thomas Chin uh, comments and asked, you know, President Biden announced in his address last night recommending a formation of a new agency similar to DARPA under NIH called Health. What can we, you and others do to make this happen? Well, I mean, you, you have in this, in this realm, in the realm of politics, you have as much power as I do. Uh, we, we all can write our senators. I, I can write these things as an expert, as can my colleagues at Tufts and elsewhere. Um, but overall, you know, this is something where groundswell from you and I is, are the, is what's going to uh, make the decisions for politicians. Our friend Siobhan Gallagher from Communications with Public Relations asks, I think you said that the study with facetin or was done with prematurely aged mice. Do you think the, the, do you think the outcome would be any different with naturally aged, aged mice? So, so they did both. Um, so I, I showed an image, the middle, I could put, I won't go back to it, but the middle, so the middle image was with prematurely aged mice. The, far image with the lifespan was with naturally aged mice. So, so they did both. Um, yeah, I should actually get a shout out to, to Laura Niederhofer at the University of Minnesota for that really fun study. Yes, uh, and Marianne Kane asks, is senolytic therapy being used or will it be used alongside cancer treatment to prevent early aging? This is, a, this is an absolutely wonderful question. Thank you for asking it because this is exactly where we went, where, where uh, my colleagues that work in cancer are going with this. Uh, most of this is being done by groups in the Netherlands, um, but I, they, a lot of them were trained um, with me at Buck um, and then they went off and founded their labs. This is actually a focus of a, a lot of people because um, some of the people that are pioneering this actually lost family members to cancer and actually watched firsthand much like I did. So they, they're very passionate about this and they're also very good scientists, which helps immensely. And absolutely, this is the exact plan is, th th there's a kind of a mild revolution right now in the cancer field where one of the ideas is to give therapies that cause cancer cells to become senescent and then eliminate the senescent cells to get rid of those cancer cells. And, and this is something that they're pushing very heavily. So about a third of the talks you see at any senescence meeting are on cancer right now. So, so I don't see any questions come, but we still have some. So maybe I, I could ask one question. Um, so I think it, it, it always is a little tricky. Um, I think the issues around you know, prolonging aging or health span are, are always tricky for pharmacologic therapy, for drug therapies. And, and I think the regulators sort of don't exactly know what to do with this yet. And then also, I guess the question is, do you think we're always gonna be in a situation where we're gonna be trying to prevent syndromes from occurring, or we're gonna to have to wait till people develop a type of cancer or some other chronic disease with aging and intervene then? I mean, how do you think about this with, with all these emerging therapies? I mean, this is kind of the, the tricky part, right? Most of the studies that have been done so far with, with senescence and with senolytics 
have been done in a preventative manner. In other words, they, they've, they find an animal model of the disease and they give them the synolytics before they've actually developed pathology and then they show that they don't develop pathology or they develop less pathology. It's, there aren't a lot, uh, there's a lot more prevention out there than there is cure right now. Um, and we might just have to settle for stopping the disease in its tracks or, or you know, slowing its progression uh, rather than reversal. But uh, which is an area I think where nutrition is better than, uh, than pharmacy at this point, if, if we're being really honest about it. You know, nutritionists, all we do is prevention, whereas, um, whereas people in pharmacy are often looking for cure. Uh, so this, this is a tricky thing to consider. I think I've seen a couple studies that have suggested that there can be some curative effects with senolytes, but uh, it's still early days. I mean, this is a field that has existed for five years. So we're, we're, we're talking a very short period of time. We don't have all the answers yet. Yeah, I, I think the excellent points, Chris. I think, you know, from someone that's looked at therapies for things like sarcopenia and senescence, if you're trying to prevent something from happening, the, the bar will, is set very high by regulators like the FDA for safety, because many of these therapies would have to be given for very long periods of time to people. So, you know, the safety issue sort of starts to become really important rather than when someone has a, a life-threatening or, or a life-ending disease where you, you, you sometimes can sacrifice some 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 of the safety profile because because there's no other way to treat or or or, or you know or to, or to treat the disease. So so yeah, it's a really these are really complicated issues. So we've got some more questions from our our audience. So let's um let's go on here. Doctor uh, Galanopoulos asked, "Are you finding any connection between senescence and specific aspects of the microbiome?" Uh, so this is an area I have not worked on. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll give another shout out. Uh, there's a researcher in Japan, Eiji Hara, who's done some of this. Uh, I can't remember. I think his results were actually that he was able to modulate liver senescence by having different gut my, micro, microbiota. I don't remember which ones did what or whatnot. This is actually kind of a, an area that I'm just starting to learn about now that I've uh, matriculated here to the HNRCA because I get to see talks on the gut microbiome now. And I, I discover that, you know, these things, we can almost look at the microbiome as a little mini factories for making all sorts of interesting things that can help us in our stomachs. And I had no idea um, about this before I actually started in this field. So maybe down the line, we'll be doing some of that work. Great, great. So Richard Alpert asks, is there any evidence supporting uh, Crescentin mediated apoptosis of senescent cells and or, or, or any other roles yeah. for, for Crescentin or quercetin. I never know how to pronounce it. Yeah, that. so actually quercetin was actually discovered bef uh, as a senolytic before Feistin. Um, it's often given, the trials right now are actually with quercetin and a um, another compound, disatinib. Um, disatinib is not my favorite compound because it's got some pretty nasty side effects. And, uh, the thing about both Quercetin and Feistin is that uh, we don't know a lot about how they function. We know they do a lot of different things. And with non-targeted small molecules, you always worry about the side effects being a problem, especially with something that would be chronic, that's a chronic type treatment. So this is always something to consider. I mean, these are, we're talking first generation first molecules discovered, um, they're never going to be the optimized one for actually getting into people. Yes, excellent, excellent points. Um, uh, so I don't have any additional open questions. So I do think at this point, we will, I really want to thank everyone for attending. I think it was a really good, excellent presentation, a really good question and answer session. I, I learned a lot and I really appreciate the, the time you put into preparing your seminar and talk today, uh, Dr. Wiley. I uh, just wanna let everyone know that this is the last event in the series and thank all of you who have attended multiple events. Uh, there is a chat feature and the link to, for, for link to, that supports the work that's being done on 
at the HNRCA. So, so Heather's going to put that in the chat. So people, if people are interested in considering ways to support this really important work that's being done by, by Chris and others at the HNRCA, that there is an opportunity to do that. And we always are grateful for support and, and, and welcome that. So thank you all very much for attending today. And, and hopefully we'll, we'll continue other sort of forums like this going forward where people can learn more about the exciting work that's being done by Chris and others at the HNRCA. So thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.